introduce our um, speakers today, but it feels like we should get started. So um, thank you for coming to the Widow Lunch Series, the final one of the year. We're super excited to have two ECD students presenting today. Um, and so uh, Becca and Maria will be talking to us about Don't Just Claim Diversity, Tell It Like It Is, Perspectives of Doctoral Students of Color at an R1 University. So listen openly, and let's see what we can reflect on and learn. Thank you both. We're very happy, first of all, to be here. We want to thank the Bueno Center for allowing the space um, and sponsoring this event. We also want to thank uh, Dr. Millie Hortz for inviting us to do this talk. Um, and we want to give a little bit of a background of how this study emerged. And um, in looking at our school's mission statement, we really wanted to be intentional about taking up uh, the mission of the school. And so part of the mission um, that we're taking up is here. Um, the mission that the School of Education is grounded in a lived commitment to democracy, diversity, equity, and justice. And we teach and conduct research to make a positive difference with and in schools and communities. And this is what this research project is really anchored on, um, to really make a difference um, in improving our climate and especially in honoring the voices of our peers, um, specifically uh, other students of color. So a little background on how this project emerged. Maria and I were both field coaches last year working in teacher education together. And um, we would travel around um, to and fro, Boulder and Thornton and Bath, and these car rates became a time for us really to dissect and debrief and think about the experiences that we've been having here in the school and then also our experiences out in the field site. And these really became like really sacred car rides where we just had a chance to debrief and process. And it was through those car rides that we knew that we wanted to do some type of work. And then in the fall, we enrolled in a research methods course in the Department of Anthropology. And that really gave us the space and the mentorship and the guidance to really get started on this project. So we want to start with stating our positionalities. Um, and so I start actually with a, with a quote that my dad wrote me when I first got enrolled into this university. He wrote me a letter, and he left it on my bed. Um, and this is one of the things that he wrote in his letter. When people would say that getting a PhD was hard, I would respond with, you don't know what hard work is. This is not hard. I would say that because I would think of my grandfather and the others that came before us and the physical labor they did. I remember seeing my people in the fields picking vegetables all day. That is hard work. Sitting in the library or Starbucks reading, <laughs> taking notes, writing is not hard work. It can be difficult and it can be tiresome, but it is not hard. And so I reflect on this statement often when I'm here because I recognize that I am in a place of privilege, that I have the chance to take the time out of my life to be here, to research, to work, to theorize, to work with amazing peers and mentors. But at the same time, I understand that, that why I'm here is on the backs of people before me and that I stand here with my ancestry before me, giving me the power to be here in this place at this time. And so for me as a Chicana woman who grew up in San Antonio and Austin, there's a rich legacy behind me, and, a, and I stand with, with my ancestry. And I, I also want to take time to say how I'm entering this space. I'm entering this space as a queer, indigenous, Mexican, um, cisgender female. And I do so acknowledging, like Becca just did, that my presence here is I'm, I'm not standing here as an individual but I really want to acknowledge my ancestors, specifically uh, what they had to endure, um, the females in, within my lineage who uh, went through genocide, uh, rape, colonization, um, and it is because of their blood, sweat, and tears, and because of the hope that um, they could provide a better future for their children and hopes of next generations. It is, I am the product, product of that, and so I, I would like to honor my ancestors um, in this moment. 
So here's our overarching research question. In what ways are graduate students of color making sense of their graduate school experiences as they prepare for diverse careers in the field of education at the University of Colorado Boulder School of Education? And we have some research sub questions. One, how do graduate students of color make sense of their experiences as graduate instructors? What are graduate students of color understanding of experiences in their assistantships? And lastly, what are graduate students of color experiences associated with mentorship and mentoring? And then we also want to talk a little bit about our attention around terminology. So in our project, you'll see that we oper operationalize the term students of color. And so we were really specific that in this project we have students self-identify as a part of whether they consider themselves part of a racial and ethnic group, distinguishing themselves as non-white. Although we also want to acknowledge that scholars have traditionally understood people of color as coming from historically marginalized groups. But it was really important for us in this project that we did not identify anyone, that everyone self-identified themselves. We, so we ground um, this work in CRT, specifically acknowledging that racism, we encounter it in our everyday lives. We, we know that racism is often hidden, and so what this project does is make the invisible visible. And we are very um, careful about acknowledging that when we're talking about race, we really have to talk about the interconnected categories um, that influence people's experiences, such as their class, their gender, their sexuality, because these overlap to create different types of marginalized experiences that are not, that have to be taken into account within a context, and they change over time. So it's a fluid type of uh, process. We also um, anchor our work uh, with Hughes and Giles' call for crit walking. It's basically um, CRT with feet. <laughs> and what this means is that it's actionable. And they say that it is a method of strategically thinking and talking through various institutional norms, policies, and procedures to reinterpret and reconnect our understanding of the intersections of race, racism, power, and praxis. So that is what we try to do in this project to really embed uh, crib walking in, in this work. So we draw upon all of these notions to shed light on the racialized experiences of students of color within the School of Education and allow space for those counter stories, testimonials to be heard. So that, that is um, our main intention here, to really shed light into those stories and make those stories that are often invisible, visible. Um, so a little bit about the context. We want to give you a little bit of background information about the current spring enrollment um, for the doctoral students here at CU. So there's a total of 82 doctoral students that enrolled in spring 2019. Um, and there are 42 white students, 9 identifying as African American, 20 Hispanic and Latino, 2 American Indian, 1 international, and 4 Asian students. That's comprised of 35 total students um, identified as students of color. You see the breakdown of gender, 69.5% uh, representing female, 30.5% representing male, and this is all coming from the Office of Institutional Research for this spring 2019 enrollment. And we also want to point out that um, the, the study that we're doing was solely based within the School of Education, and it was solely um, done with doctoral <coughs> students. So we, have, um, we conducted um, a survey, um, and 31 doctoral students, um, both white and non-students um, of color, filled it out. Out of those 31, 11 self-identified as students of color. We did a focus group of six students, um, and these six students were from different um, timelines within their doctoral trajectory. Uh, we even had one alumni. And then we did 12 individual interviews 
two of those being very uh, thorough. So two of those were uh, three, um, three semi-interviews. Uh, um, those were oral histories that we captured. So a little more information about our survey. We sent out our survey using the PhD listserv, and like Maria said, this is for all PhD students. Um, we asked students to self-identify as a student of color, and based on their response, they received an additional three questions on their experiences in the doctoral program. Um, we did have participants respond from every year in the program, including alumni, and like as we mentioned, 31 participants and 11 who self-identify as students of color. For the focus group, um, there were there were there was representation from male and female students, and the participants ranged from their first year all the way up to their fifth fifth year at Arizona alumni, and there were a total of six participants. Um, like we said, twelve total interviews. The length ranged from twenty five to two hours. Um, and like Maria mentioned, out of these 12 interviews, two were more in-depth than were life history interviews. So we've, we were very methodical about how we analyzed the data, and it, it, it was a great process because it, uh, it, this analysis started um, fall of last year, um, and it continued um, until recently. So what we did was um, we used grounded theory approach to begin um, looking at the data. So for our survey, we only looked at data supplied by um, those students that self-identified as students of color. So we began to read the responses. The survey um, was basically an open-ended questionnaire. And so we used Google Sheets to um, create codes, and we returned to those um, on, on several occasions. So Becca looked at it, she did coding, and then I did coding, and then we came together, and it was a iterative, iterative process where we did multiple cycles of coding, and again, we only analyzed um, the responses from the students of color. So then we had the focus group interviews. And so during and after the interviews, we noted themes that we saw emerging. Um, we took notes individually on these themes, and then we brought them to each other to collectively analyze. And again, we engaged in multiple cycles of coding for both of these methods. And then we also, since we were going through this project with the guidance of our research methods course in the Department of Anthropology, we also had mentorship by a professor who helped us as we were guiding that we could debrief and discuss with her as well. This was truly a collaborative work. Um, we had multiple data retreats where we would come and get together and sit for hours talking about what we noticed and what we saw. Numerous informal meetings on top of that to discuss and analyze the data. Um, and then through this collaborative work, we found <coughs> really two overarching themes and how students make sense of their experiences in that after all program. I will also add that um, we, we shared preliminary findings with students, doctoral students from different departments at the university, and we received very good feedback um, about ways in which we could um, analyze mm -hmm. and code some of the things that we were seeing. So um, today, in order to honor the commitments we made to our peers and acknowledging that there are very few doctoral students of color within the School of Education, we will not be presenting any direct quotes um, because they otherwise would be identifiable. So in order to really make sure that we protect their identities, we will be presenting um, overarching themes, and those themes will be unpacked uh, and made uh, more, they're, they're, they're very much lots of layers within each one of the themes that we will be discussing. and. Um, and I think that's it. That's what I want to say about that. Okay, so like Maria was saying, two overarching themes, um, but they are layers of complexity within each theme. So these, but these are the two broad ones. Students cite the importance of recognizing safe and unsafe spaces. And two, students express feeling burdened by the additional emotional and tangible work that they do. So the first 
thing that um, came out repeatedly in the interviews, focus group, and even survey um, answers was this idea of safe spaces. And safe spaces w were both discussed in a physical and also metaphorical way. Um, physically, participants expressed that it was very difficult to share their lived experiences, often in, within classrooms, in meetings, or with individual people um, within the School of Education because they were often positioned as your stories are not, um, and I quote what was said, not grounded in empirical research. So often it was difficult to share within coursework uh, a different type of experience or um, something that came from their own uh, family or community because often it was positioned against uh, published empirical articles and um, was rendered insignificant. And so we would like um, to reframe and understand um, why this is a problem. And we um, look to what a crit scholar, Brian Brayboy, who says that when we share stories, we create and share theory. And stories are not separate from theory in our communities. They make up theory and are therefore real and legitimate sources of data and ways of being. And so um, he discusses this further in his essay, Tribal Critical Race Theory. So we, we would like to reposition the idea that when we speak about our stories and when we engage um, experiences from our community, those um, also are legitimate. And like uh, the scholar Bray Boy says, those are part of how we theorize. Um, another way in which safe spaces was talked about, it was through systems of power. That um, many times um, uh, our participants said that navigating ac academia was difficult because they didn't know how their positionalities would be taken up within certain spaces. Um, and some of the phrases that they used were, um, it's hard to navigate, uh, they, they're left feeling unsure they're mystified by the system, and this happens when they share themselves within the space, and oftentimes because of how they present physically, they may be perceived in different ways, or and many times uh, the concern was that they were essentialized as people, um, and so they were left feeling unsure of how to navigate those those sort of things. So. We look towards um, uh, Theodosia, who says, some knowledges have been used um, to silence, margina marginalize, and render people of color invisible. So um, what we are looking at is, why do people feel so unsafe to come into a space or are unsure? And it's because many times um, the ways in which courses are framed, spaces are framed, um, they're not acknowledging uh, or privileging certain knowledges. So um, we, we really um, are trying to push for an acknowledgement of what Patricia Hill Collins says, uh, the, the legitimizing outsider knowledges. Uh, what Anzalua speaks of as mestiza knowledges, or Bell Hooks calls transgressive knowledges to be legitimized and um, we will have recommendations for how to do that at the end. Um, on, on the other hand, um, there's lots of ways in which faculty, mentors, and white allies are providing um, what students are saying are safe spaces. And um, all of these points I want to acknowledge are from a, a colleague, a, a peer, a scholar that I greatly admire. Um, in the School of Education who, who took time to write down ways in which they felt they were being um, welcomed into the space. So one of those ways is by creating relationships based on mutual respect and equity. 
What does that mean? Um, it means she didn't feel like she was a workhorse for um, people with power in, in the space. It meant that her knowledge was often welcomed and encouraged, and people made space for that. Um, mentors shared opportunities for advancement, and so those sort of things were made um, visible, oftentimes when it was difficult to navigate how, how do we know uh, what journal review opportunities out, are out there, what sort of guest lecturing opportunities um, are available, um, invitations to meeting with funders, um, those sort of things were provided to these students. And then um, another aspect that was shared was uh, authorship and how oftentimes like a, a great experience for these students were that authorship was made very clear from the very beginning and so um, those power dynamics were, were made visible and it was very clear as to how both parties would proceed. And uh, these mentors also created collaborative time to write and get feedback on writing. The faculty or mentor um, had a very strong commitment to recruiting students of color. And um, oftentimes in informal meetings, um, invisible, the invisible codes of power were made visible to the student. Um, and so we understand this, this work of allowing um, students of color and creating space, safe spaces for them to do the work um, by citing um, the great work that our colleagues have done in the School of Education. Um, <coughs> the scholars of color that we really deeply admire, Jenny Logan, Brian Lightfoot, and Ana Contreras, who um, published this piece Black and Brown Millennial Activism on the PWI, primarily white institution campus in the era of Trump. And so in this piece, they speak to um, the experience of, even though there were tensions within uh, the space, it still, they still uh, were allowed within the space to enact their activism. And so um, this goes back to the spaces, those mentors, white allies and faculty were able to create um, for them to be able to, to then engage in, in the work that they're passionate about. So the second thing that we're going to be discussing is a burden is placed upon students of color. And so we found that students felt as though some faculty benefit professionally from having access to researching groups of people where students come from. Um, this may be access to community organiza organizations, this could be school districts, teacher relationships, but in this sense faculty are actually capitalizing and benefiting professionally and financially from students of color. And so we tie this um, to Derek Bell's notion of interest convergence. Um, the idea that white elites tolerate racial diversity advances only if it benefits their own individual group interests. And so we saw that emerge from the student's point of view in multiple instances. Um, and then part of that, students expressed that they felt as though white males seemed to be prioritized over other groups of students. Students expressed also that they felt like they were presenting this forward-facing image of diversity for, for the school, but yet not necessarily be benefiting themselves from that forward image. Along with this, students expressed that they felt they are responsible for negotiating issues related to racism, discrimination, and marginalization. And that they express when they are taking up these issues, oftentimes they are framed negatively in ways where they're considered problematic, angry, emotional, in need of help, and in need of self-care. So in that sense, really trivializing the experiences that students are feeling. And I think it's really important to name this and state this. Um, and this really goes to others working for us, such as Smith, Yoso, and Sorazano. And they refer often to these feelings as racial battle fatigue. And this refers to an illness you can actually physically feel, physical ailments, and diminished mental in diminished mental capabilities, which are caused by these racial attacks and microaggressions that are occurring inside and outside of the classroom. And so one thing students expressed throughout all these interviews was that feeling they are very alone in feeling like this and feeling like 
I'm being too sensitive, this might be in my head, maybe I'm just looking for a problem. And so in that sense, many students felt isolated, but across the board, in every interview, we heard similar statements. And so from us hearing these things and being able to voice, no, we all feel this, we all are in this together, is a way to really name that we feel this racial battle fatigue. So we're gonna offer some recommendations based on our findings. And these recommendations um, were based on our participants' res uh, responses. So um, we want to honor their voices that all of this is coming from our, our peers. One of the things that they recommended was that they would like more flexible options for completion to sustain and support students of color. What this means is that oftentimes um, students of color have deep commitments to their communities they have deep commitments to family, and so uh, this stands in tension with sort of this individual notion that we have to do this PhD on our own, and um, we should be 100 full-time committed to, to the trajectory. This um, is in tension with some of the commitments, um, cultural commitments people have, and so oftentimes people are at a crossroad where they have to decide can I continue with this PhD trajectory? Um, and so uh, many times it's like, I guess I can't, and so we end up dropping out of the program because of external things. So we're asking for more flexible options. Um, and also one, of, one thing that came up several times was developing a uh, Students of Color Caucus. So this means that um, within this framework of having seminars, um, and I know each program area has seminars, we're asking for one seminar for only students of color so that we can process and we can learn um, ways to do things that um, maybe our white peers don't necessarily have trouble navigating or speaking about things. So we would like a seminar with students of color, possibly um, with only faculty of color, or led by students of color. And then also uh, this notion of transparency <coughs> and preparation for future professional opportunities. Oftentimes, um, it's not very clear what sort of um, commit, how, what will happen after graduation. Um, one of the participants mentioned that she was shocked when she learned what the uh, faculty, um, uh, tenure track faculty uh, salary was. Um, and this was a shock, a shock to her because she uh, has lots of debt. And so going through this process, um, knowing that even after graduation, she will be living um, with a very poor salary because of the debt payments she has to make. Um, that was not very transparent to her, and so she said those sort of things need to be explicit and named. Um, and so, and also job opportunities, knowing that there aren't a lot of tenure track jobs out there, and so what will that mean for the graduate? <coughs> Another vein of recommendations comes with training for faculty and staff. And so one thing that has come up is really training faculty advisors on the characteristics of mentorship and advising. Um, along with that, you know, as a school of education, we are charged with teaching our pre-service teachers how to enact anti-racist teaching and how to enact culturally sustaining pedagogy. But students offered have faculty received that same training. What training have they received on culturally sustaining pedagogy for the or graduate doctoral or seminar? Um, another vein of training would be training faculty in how to be allies training faculty in to interrogate cultural, pro pro cultural appropriation, white fragility and privilege, and include more scholars of color in the syllabi. Um, and then also transparency. When issues arise, transparency and how, transparency how to report these mechanisms, things that arise in your assistantships, things that arise in the classrooms that you're in, things that arise even in your own seminar. So how do we offer ways to support students when issues arise? And then we also want to end with these final thoughts and also recognizing that this work was 
deeply collaborative. We are representing the voices of our, of our dear colleagues and our dear peers and the work that has come before us. And that our work draws on the strengths of communities of colors. If methodologies have been used to silence and marginalize people of color, then methodologies can also give voice and turn the margins into place for transformative resistance. I also want to point these, these out from Dr. Miles, who says, you know, this work is, is difficult work. Um, it is work that makes people uncomfortable. And I think it's, it's important for us to acknowledge that um, when we talk about race and discrimination and, and equity, it will make us uncomfortable. Um, and I think it's, it's important to, to, to know that. Um, and for um, our students of color in the room um, know that you belong um, and know that you know these systems were not necessarily made for, for us um, but we're still here and we are enriching uh, the space with our our lived experiences and um, with who we are um, so please please know that thank you mm -hmm. emails and we asked students to request if they wanted to be part of the focus group and that what became really amazing about this project was that the more people started hearing about it they said oh, I heard you're doing the focus group are you going to have another one or oh I heard you're doing interviews can I can I come speak with you and so we didn't seek anybody specifically out we waited for people to come to us and I think it also shows us how fruitful the, these spaces became our interviews as you saw lasted for hours sometimes our focus group was felt so enriching, like a therapy session. Like it was just, the experience was so generative for us and I hope also for the people that participated. I just want to thank you both so much for this rich and powerful presentation. I um, know it can be hard to speak to a room of your peers, but also a peer of the faculty who are implicated in some of these things. And so I just want to name that and thank you for bringing that towards us. And um, I don't have a specific question, just an invitation, because I, I really want to work with implementing a lot of your recommendations, and so I want to find ways that I can support next steps from this. So please let me know. I, I mean, I, Liz stole my thunder. I was going to say the same thing. Which is, I really appreciate your bravery in bringing this to us in the carefulness and thoughtfulness with which you did the work and and um, and your um, and just the incredible dedication you had to to really keep following this passion project of yours mm -hmm. to its completion and to bring it in such a lovely and professional way to all of us it means an incredible amount and and please do know that we will you know, we've already talked about it, but we will continue to follow up and continue to talk about it, and it will make a huge difference. Um, I, I guess my question is just, I was, I'm wondering if anything surprised you about this, and if you can talk about what, what it was that felt surprising. For me, what was most surprising was in every single interview and within the focus group, um, people expressed surprise that other students of color were going through the same experience and they thought, I must be wrong. I, I must not be right because I don't see it in the literature. And so feelings of isolation, feelings of um, not belonging or constantly having their story be counteracted with and made invisible by not having scholars of color in the syllabi, by not um, discussing you know, certain issues in, in classrooms. Um, many people thought that they were the ones in the wrong. And so in coming together, it, it was um, very surprising how, um, how in shock other students of color were with 
oh, I'm, I'm not the only <coughs> one, I'm not going crazy. There are other people who are also feeling the same things that I'm feeling. So that was, that was surprising for me. I think also when I had mentioned, you know, we were a little bit nervous in the beginning. Um, like we said, we didn't want to seek anybody out. And so sending out that initial email about having focus groups and interviews, it's how is it going to be received? We want to make sure our peers really, you know, want to be part of this and that, and that the acceptance, like people were so excited about the work that we were doing from our, you know, from our friends, from our peers, from our classmates. I think that really was surprising and exciting and, you know, let us know that we were on the right track with the work. So I, if I may ask you to go back a few slides where you have some of the recommendations, including the one that deals with it, why fragility and appropriation and all of those things, which are very important. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm an engineer. Um, being a faculty here in engineering as the only underrepresented minority in 150, 135 years, 125 years, 26 now, um, to be tenured, and I am fighting for my tenure. They turn my day, some of them in this school, um, turn my scholarly, published in high impact citation uh, journals as uh, service because they happen to address problems in our communities. I'm an environmental engineer, but I'm a mechanical engineer by training, so I can do quite a bit of things. And I do not have the imposter syndrome. I shed that when I Stanford when I was in graduate school. I know what I can do and more. Um, and so one thing that I see is that when scholars of color start moving into these spaces, mm -hmm. this resistance, because we may be establishing a new norm and a new standard, which many of these people will not meet. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I think is happening in engineering. Mm -hmm. You know, by being able to work with the communities directly without having to use people mm -hmm. to get to them, and at the end, yield no benefits to the communities. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make them look good. Mm -hmm. So I can see that very clearly, mm -hmm. and so, even if the scholarship is there, how do we counter? I mean, I just met right before I came here with somebody, because I'm going to be doing a workshop all day long for engineering, mm -hmm. uh, environmental engineering professors about the lack of diversity in environmental engineering, which you may or may not know, but it's over 80% white. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of the very few Latinas in that field and in the faculty. And, you know, it's been a lonely road. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is, has to do with this. People take your culture and they interpret it in their own way. They have nothing to do with what we are. Nothing to do. And they come up with results and they publish and, and it's all catastrophic failures because it's based on made up theories about who we are. And every time we allow that, it's problematic because the, the schools do not, do not yield good scholarship. Uh, we do not motivate other students of color to follow on our footsteps or their footsteps because you know, you're doing things that in many cases are not valued. And we also do not provide, you know, examples for our young students who want to be scholars. Um, and we don't benefit the community. It's, 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 it's a big problem in many different dimensions. So when you put these things over there, you really got to me, to the core of the problem. You know, this cultural appropriation needs to stop. There's no way a white person can be an expert on Latino issues if you don't speak the language, if you never live in that community, if you don't even have respect to these people. We do the same thing in engineering. We have tons of people who are going abroad to other countries with no IRBs. I mean, this is the argument I have with environmental engineers. You go to Africa and you do all these technology interventions and they're all failure after failure after failure. Why? Because we have no respect for these people. We don't do what our IRBs, we do not listen to what they have to say, we just tell them this is the technology you need to use, we have nothing to do with what they need. This is that engineer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to make that case with my own. Yeah. But you know, we're in a room of people in education, so I see it's the same problem. Mm -hmm. It has to do that as long as we have our peers who want to do the research in our communities and sell themselves as the same, because for us it's the, you know, the white savior, syndrome. Uh, they're not going to save anybody. They create the problems, they come to pretend to solve them, and they only make the problems bigger. So there are not going to be the solution, and we need to stand up and say enough is enough. But this whole thing about the next 
item is the why fragility? Because there are people who have good intentions, many of them in this room. But when somebody tells you it's not your business to study my people because you're not going to get it right, and you're just going to waste everybody's time and money, and on top of that, you're going to prevent real scholars that will make a difference from getting those grants, from publishing that literature, and actually making a difference, you have to take it, honestly say, you know, maybe I should go to Appalachia and study white people there, because frankly, they need it. So we can prevent another Trump. Yeah. Um, you know, all of these things are collect connected. And when you disconnect them, because it is more convenient to say, I'm just gonna study Latinos. I mean, like, we have this in the public health. I'm sorry I'm talking too much, but, you know. <laughs> I've been here for over eight years, nine years. I came here to be a scholar. This is a dead end, I'm sorry, for, for scholars of color. And it's my resolution to shine a light, shine a light on this place so that no self-respecting scholar of color comes here. Because some of us, frankly, we have the best education this country has to offer. I got my degrees in engineering from Stanford, number one in environmental engineering. I have a postdoc from Harvard, and I come here, and I'm having people here tell me that my scholarship is not scholarship unless a white man does it. How is that? And people are okay with that. And I will say, when you say you're an ally, you gotta put your money with them, where your mouth is, because there's no ally when you hide behind your doors or behind papers or somebody like students of color, because this is the, the thing that is the most, such, most shameful of all, that we are the ones who are carrying these crosses. We are the ones doing the work, and we are the ones out here trying to teach you. And you are the ones who are safe. You are the safe ones, not us. When you say some safe spaces, I came here and I said, I hope it's a safe space. I don't, I don't know if it is. I won't count on it. But I don't care anymore. I really don't. Because at this point, it's like, they're in a business of destroying people like me, so I'm in the business of destroying people like them. Because they're the ones that gotta go. They're the ones who destroy our country. And so if anybody here is comfortable with that, well, you're part of the problem. But if you have a problem with that, you ought to say, what can I do to change things? And each one of us needs to do something. Don't put it on these two young ladies or on me. I mean, I tell people, I, you know, I take it on because I don't have this, you know, this syndrome that other people have. I know I have what it takes, and I've had it for a long time. And it didn't come from Stanford, and it didn't come from Harvard. It came from my mother, who taught me that I was the smarter one around. I figured that out in third grade, <laughs> and I have no qualms with that. And so, all I'm asking is that if you can take what you've done and expand it to all the fields, I can tell you engineers are suffering. You know, we have had, it doesn't count about, you know, mental illness and everything that we're dealing with, a whole bunch of suicides with young people. And I think in engineering, a lot of it has to do with the disconnect between doing engineering that is meaningful, that makes us human, human, and the ones that the white guys want us to do, make money for the rich people. Frankly, I'd rather die than do that. So when we look at all these things, if you can expand this, as I know that in education you have these theories and stuff, I'm just an engineer. I do things that make sense. And usually sometimes it turns out to some nice analysis, some mixed methods or so forth. To me, it's just you know, being logical. So I think there's something to work with because the experience of those students of color here is the same as people of color of any rank. Except if you're a sellout, which we do have a couple of them in engineering. So, the whole thing is you either buy into that or you are the resistance. And some of us are the resistance. And so, but that resistance need to turn into success because it is tiresome. And if you want to be successful for the benefits of the future generations, we need to stop just talking about, you know, words and actually act, you know, doing actions. You know, what is it that is going to happen? Where are you going to go with your degrees? I mean, I don't know how many faculty we have here, but I figured there's a few. And maybe you can say, how, you, how do you enable uh, these people to go to a place where they can actually do something and not end up in, in, in black holes like this place? I'm so sorry for those of you who are here. I mean, I'm trying to stay here, but not because I think it's the greatest place. Let's be clear. 
is because this place needs so much work. They need really smart people who have the right intentions and the guts to do it. Amen. You said it beautifully. <laughs> I'm sorry, it took too long. No, no, it's wonderful. And I love the idea of connecting across other colleges yeah. because this is a fight everywhere. Yes. Yeah, first of all, I want to congratulate you for being in the PG program. I did being there on that. <laughs> I know how hard it is. And, and then I want to continue with this research and then the, do the second part. I want to see the results, what the administration and the department did following those recommendations. And also to expand it to the arts and sciences or to the whole university. Yeah. And that's something that goes to what she was talking because that was the discussion I had this morning. <laughs> People coming here and said, I am so upset. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I said, we were talking about the presidential candidate. And I said, it doesn't surprise me because it shows mm -hmm. that we have, that's the CU. Mm -hmm. When I came here, I came from another state. I was in shock that CU is so behind. Mm -hmm. And when I see the president, I said, I'm not surprised because at all levels, Lower level, middle level, high level is the same. It is the white man. Mm -hmm. But it's, and this person told me, oh, but see, you is so liberal. No, it is not. It mm -hmm. has the label. It hasn't worked the talk. No. Mm -hmm. It's just the label. No, this is white. This is white. This is privileged students. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like a private college that we are teaching here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a lot of responsibility for us. And I understand you because, yeah, I, I, yes, I know. And so, yeah, I want you to continue and show us results. I mean, I hope you can do it. Show results and congratulations being there can be done. Yes. Yeah. Um, so first, thank you uh, for the talk and for the work you're doing. And I just, I wanted to, um, to your point. I'm sorry, by the way. I'm Lupita Montoya. Lupita sorry. Montoya. Um, there's, um, there is a scholar at Vanderbilt, her name's Ebony Howard, and her work, she's a black woman, she's, she should be tenured now, but her work is all in conversation with women of color in STEM and in, in higher ed, and so it would be just useful work, I think, to, to connect with, mm -hmm. um, to make the work feel less isolated. And then my question for you guys is, so I appreciate um, suggestions on what to do here, it sounds like they all make sense. I want to flip it though, like, how are you going to use this to benefit your careers? Like, is, yeah. so are, are you thinking publication? Like, where, like, what, what are those steps looking like? Um, so this, this work um, was, is framed um, very much with a decolonial um, commitment. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that the, at the forefront, the thought is not on individual types of accomplishments or individual types of advancement. It's, it's more of, it's a passion project that we decided to take on as something extra, um, going above her coursework and above what we already do. Um, so I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm in shock that we were able to do all of this um, because we have so much going on. But um, this was more of to add to the work that has already been done by our colleagues who are ahead. And so we want to um, first and foremost acknowledge that there's been lots of work um, pushing towards more equitable spaces for students of color and knowing that this is just a continuation um, of that. So we take up that moral commitment. Um, and knowing that the work is still continuing, so that this is, this is just a little tiny part of what other students of color are doing. Um, and so this is actually joining that, that work as well. Um, so in terms of whether we want to take this into publication or whatever. I, uh, for me, I will, say, I will state that a name that um, 
I would possibly think of that if I if I thought that it would um, serve um, people in the right ways. I all of that to say, like uh, publication was not at, like at the forefront, and I know that this space, um, uh, what many scholars have called a white ivory tower, um, have things like publication um, at the forefront to be able to then get a job or whatever. Um, I'm not concerned with that sort of thing um, because this project, again, um, is, is decolonial in my mind and doesn't, doesn't stand as like an individual sort of project, mm -hmm. but more as a relational one. Thank you very much. Um, this is great to see all together and really think about, um, my question is around the transparency on reporting mechanisms, which I think is um, great to really come up with a system, like who you talk to, where can some of these be kind of collected to really think about structurally, you know, in this class, this is going on in this class, you know, one of the classes I had with you, like, oh, these days, really, you know, let's talk about what happened yeah. in class that day. And just wondering how would, just ideas of how that would work and not maybe have retribution connected to mm -hmm. or blown up to be yeah. where it's just this individual interaction when it really is a structural thing that needs to be addressed with that professor mm -hmm. or with that um, mentor. So just wondering some ideas on maybe that could be central for Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I, will, I will say that um, this is an issue that um, has um, my administration is already working on and um, and if I can name that Liz um, has been at the forefront of like looking more deeply in thinking of how those things can be structured, um, those are issues that have been brought up. And so, yeah, one one of the things that you named about not receiving retribution is is very much you know very important and at the forefront of, of those concerns. So um, all of that to say that like that's being worked on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to make a comment about you can't just make something because I really don't like this idea that you don't want to publish this because you want to do this for the goodness of this. I will tell you, it is needed. And some of us need this to be able to quote. I mean, one of the one of my colleagues that talked to my dean, who talked about my research as surface, she wrote a letter to explain to him that that is documented racism in academia. The brown on brown um, research taboo is very well documented. Now, it hasn't happened in engineering because there are not too many of us in engineering, <laughs> but it has been documented by other places. And the people who published that paper was people from this institution 30 years ago. 30. So 30 years later, this institution is still doing it. Still doing it. So for you to say it's good enough for this, no, it's not good enough because some of us really need it. So you're doing a service to change the system. And I will say, you go and you find those few white allies, faculty, to turn this into a publishable piece of work so that you can benefit other people. Because if it ends here, mm -hmm. it is not gonna benefit anybody. Mm -hmm. And so you gotta be thinking, it's beyond me. It's not about me anymore. Just like I don't think this fight with CU is about me anymore. It's about my people. It's about my discipline. It's about this, my country. It's not about those whatever four or five guys. And so the idea is we all have something to do. and You have to do your part. So don't do it because, and I, I will say this for those of you who don't know anything about it, you're Mexican, and so am I. <laughs> for us, the moment that we put a value for something and we get something in return, it diminishes what we've done as goodness. So it is not about being dumb, it's about being good and about having and, and honoring our upbringing. It works against us all the time. We come from very humble people and that's why I say sometimes I don't sound Mexican. But because I've been around white people enough. And I'm, a, you know, like I said, I'm an engineer, so I've come to terms with that. I'm humble when I need to be, but I'm not when I don't need to be. And so do not be humble on this one. Do not. It doesn't do us any good, and we need it. I desperately, I will be quoting you, because this kind of stuff has been going on for too long, and to show the progression, we're talking about decades of the same thing over and over, then the pattern is there. 
it needs to change. Mm -hmm. So we need that evidence, and you need to put it out there. So if there's any faculty here who feels compelled enough to sit down with you and figure out how you can turn it into a publishable piece of work, please do. And you have to be pushy about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that again. <laughs> well, we will be presenting this at the Critical Race Studies and Education Conference at the end of May. So we're excited to be getting some mentorship and some advising on, on this work and how we can improve upon it. Yeah, but that's very small. Wow. <laughs> that doesn't count, frankly. It has to be published. Yeah, you know, and also because you have to show what is reality here. Yes. And that's the only way. Yeah. So we have to use the tools of the Mm -hmm. you know, we have to use them. We have to approve it, okay? And if you don't pro publish, another one is going to do it. No. And guess what? Who's going to be? <laughs> <laughs> the Nawalves. Lupita, te agradezco todo lo que dijiste está spot on. Pero estoy, con ningún punto no estoy de acuerdo contigo. They don't need white allies to push this work forward. That's right. But, don't need but white if allies. they haven't published their own, they need to step back. back. And I think you all push this work forward. Y si necesitan ayuda, piensa quién les puede ayudar. Pero que esa voz doesn't take over. Su voz tiene que estar al frente de esto. White allies can step back on this one. Because ultimately it has to be published. So um, I will say something, because I have some of my students trying to publish, and they didn't quite know how to get it done. And the moment I take over, in terms of, you know, okay, this is how we have to do it, this is the level it has to be, this is the standard it has to be, then we get it published. So after a while, you know what it takes, so that's the benefit that you can have having somebody who has the experience. Because, you know, this is something, I mean, this is not rocket science. You can, you can figure it out after a while, what, what will be the standard, what won't. So if you haven't had that experience, you need somebody to guide you to make sure that it doesn't take too long. That's what I mean. I just had a question. Um, you mentioned how you were surprised that a lot of students were um, um, thought they were the only one, um, which is surprising for, for me to hear, just based on my own personal experiences. Um, I just got I just got here, so I'm also very curious to to see you to Boulder. Um, I'm curious about um, what people said or what your experiences have been in terms of um, affinity group support. Are there doctoral students that are participating in Latin American student groups? Uh, African American student groups, LGBT student groups, is that, is it, at what levels are they operating, has it been helpful, is it doing what you'd hope it, you know, and helping people continue on their academic trajectory such that they're not sort of, you know, failing. Yeah. yeah. So, no. I will say here, um, as a graduate student of color collective, um, that we um, are a part of, but it's um, very few people actually attend. Um, and it comprises um, graduate students across the university, which is really nice. Um, but um, this year, it just started back up, and so we have been meeting on a monthly basis, but there's not much participation in it. Um, but as in terms of like affinity type groups specifically, I don't know of any that exist. Um, yeah, and that was like my point of frustration coming my first year also. Um, I know the undergrads have more affinity groups and so I've sometimes stepped into their space sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just to get you know positive energy from those spaces. Um, and so that is why the recommendation about the Students of Color Caucus was important for, for the, uh, the participants because there isn't any type of you know formalized support or um, affinity groups that um, are forming. So. This is kind of a follow-up question on that. Thank you both for the presentation. Um, so the need for safe spaces and counter spaces mm -hmm. comes out so strongly where people of color can share their experiences and process. And you guys had that sort of, you know, during this research, mm -hmm. and even before you were talking about the car rides, they became a safe space, yeah. and that's what, kind of what gave birth to this, mm -hmm. right? And then the research, in a way, became it. Some of your interviews mm -hmm. and focus groups um, became a safe space mm -hmm. or a counter space. How can we support those in the School of Ed? And is it possible 
I always wonder about this, like when they become institutionalized, are they no longer safe spaces? Mm -hmm. And how, so if, do they, can they be in the school of ed or do they have to be outside? Mm -hmm. And if they have to be outside, how can we support them as members of the institution? Um, what are your thoughts on that? And I'm not sure, I mean, it sounds like a, a caucus is sort of a hybrid. It might be like a formal institutionalized group and it might be an informal, I don't know, but I don't know if you have thoughts about how we can support these and have them still be autonomous and organic. Yeah. Well, I will say the focus groups that we had was here on campus. And so we, we often find it even in our own office, like our office becomes our safe space. That conference room that we had downstairs became our safe space. It was more about us having the opportunity to convene together solely us. And I know one thing we've talked about with Anna with the restructuring and the rebuilding of the, of the school is could there be a space designated for us for like a common meeting area that we can have meetings that we could do our caucus meetings so like physically somewhere within the school of ed that we could go and have a chance to debrief within within the walls i think would be really powerful because we we cultivate it outside right we find these safe spaces outside of the school but what about when things happen in here where can we go yeah i i would add that um, based on what our participants said, you're right, um, it, those safe spaces were more like informal um, and maybe on an individual level. And I think part of the tension that arose from um, the reflection of our participants was that it's, it's not enough, it, there, it's not seen at, in the institutional level. And so I think there, there is a push to have that, to sort of um, reframe the ways in which um, courses are structured, our, um, our doctoral program is structured so that more voices um, are included and not just like canon, North American canon type of voices. Do you think from your, from your findings that it would be helpful um, to take any of your, your suggestions and, and the things that, that you come up with and formalize them in the school of ed or certain department like uh, mission statements or values or policies and that like can be referred back to like this is what we said we're going to do or these are our goals like um, to, to change maybe some of our, our, our committed and like written policies as a school of ed or as an organization? Uh, or do you think that, like, like the, the, the question that once it becomes institutionalized, it's, it's for their, mm, it, it, it has more problems. I, I just ask that because, like I see there's a lot of deans and uh, chairs <laughs> here in the room who maybe, like, you know, do that sort of work. I think, like I mentioned, like, this, this is um, one part of many great initiatives and things that are happening. In, within the school of ed, um, mostly that I know of, like uh, student led, but then also like uh, administrators are like very open and, and taking up all of this. So I think it it's a continuous <laughs> discussion. Um, I I'm I don't know I don't I can't speak for myself, um, but I would like for it to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well then, thank you so much.